بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد عيلة حبت في الله continue on in the study of our treaties by Imam Muqbil bin Hadi al Wadi Allah يرحمه ويسكنه في جنة فردوس آمين يا رب العالمين the Imam said and of course this is a continuation of his book Hadhi Dawatana wa Aqidatana this is our call and this is our creed the Imam, we read the portion of the treatise where the Imam said لا نرى خروج على الحكام المسلمين مهما كانوا مسلمين ولا نرى الانقلابات سبب للإصلاح بل لإفس بل لإفساد المجتمع. The Imam said, "Allah yarhamhu." He said, "And we do not see, we do not view, we do not hold this in our creed to rebel against the Muslim leaders as long as they remain Muslim. Nor do we see that rebellion or." revolt or revolution revolutions to be a means for rectification rather we see it as a as if sad for the society we see it as something that is uh, destructive or evil or something that spoils the society so here the Imam pointed out to something very, very important, and this is the Aqidah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, and you'll find this in the early treatises, and we've mentioned this countless times. Go back to Shara Sunnah li uh, Imam Babahari, go back to uh, who was a fourth century scholar, I believe, third or fourth century. Actually, it would be in the fourth century. I think he died around 329 Hijri or something like this. Uh, before him, Imam Ahmed, one of the four Imams, uh, in his book, um, Asul al Sunnah, also uh, Asul al Sunnah Lil Al Alakai, and the many, many, many books, uh, Al Khalal, his book, great, these are great books of the Salaf, which mention. Tons and tons of narrations from the Salaf of this Ummah regarding the Tahrim, regarding the prohibition of rebelling against the Muslim authority even if he's an oppressive leader. And this was the creed of Imam Muqbil, Rahmatullah And this is more importantly the creed of the Salaf of this Ummah. And it comes from Kitabi La wa Sunnah to Rasul sallallahu alayhi Wasallam, and we've spoken extensively in our book in, in our study of Shara Sunnah, Imam Barbahari, and in Aqidat Wasatiyah, and many, many uh, videos and sittings, as well as uh, many of the Tulab al Alam and the Ulama, and have, uh, you know, you can find it in a plethora of evidence and a plethora of material illustrating that this is prohibited in Islam and that. There is no other opinion with regards to this that is mu'tabar, that is considered. Because the vast majority, and rather later the Salaf reached consensus that the Imam, as long as he's a Muslim, then you cannot rebel against him. Even if he was a wicked fadger, and go back to the books like Imam uh, Tahawi, Aqidat Tahawiyya, Tahawiyya, and other books, and you'll find uh, these issues uh, explored extensively. And in regards to the statement of Imam Muqbil, so he said, <coughs> the the one who uh, explained it, he said, al khuruj al hukam baliyatun min bilaya, bilaya, alati ubtila biha al-Muslimun min zaman qadim, wa ahl al-Sunnah bihamdulillah, Bihamdulillah, la yaroon al-khuruj ala al-hukam al-Muslim, 
لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من أتاكم وأمركم وأمركم جميع على رجل واحد يريد أن يشق عصاكم أو يفرق جماعتكم فاقتلوه in the hadith of Arfaja radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh, before that so he said that the that rebelling against the leader the, the Muslim rulers is a trial from the many types of trial and tribulations and fitna that the Muslims are tested with and he said and this is from uh, from the early times meaning this this fitna because it, it began with the fitna of the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila and other groups that took the same madhab of rebelling against oppressive leaders and Muslim, uh, you know, oppressive Muslim leaders and other than them, whoever they felt was oppressive. So this fitna is something qadim, it's something uh, that was in the past that the, uh, the ulama of the Salaf, they had to deal with these uh, individuals who believed, who called to rebelling against the Muslim authority. <clears throat> and he said, so this is an old test and trial for the Muslims. And look at now, this is one of the biggest fitness that we have with a lot of the groups. Look at how many countries that we've seen that have been toppled the leaders. Tunisia was supposedly a peaceful uh, semi, the people began to demonstrate and protest and the leader fled. So that was with minimal blood spilling uh, bloodshed in the beginning but then it's still going on they're still now they're trying to have uh, supposed democratic elections and they're still fitna and they're afraid of the tekfiris of blowing up the people who want to vote uh, for their leaders likewise Egypt is still unstable they have a leader they went through the democratic process and they you know which was supposed to validate things and at the same time, Akhwan al Muslimin, they won the position. But those secularists weren't happy with that, and they overthrew Akhwan al Muslimin even. So Akhwan al Muslimin, they played the political game, and it backfired on them, as it, it always does. So it shows us uh, a thing about the Minhaj and the Minhaj that really elections is not really the place uh, for Ahlul Sunnah to take place in. You're not going to get those reforms because they don't even honor, there's enough forces in the society and the society is, is, is very splintered to where that doesn't tend to be successful. But getting on back to the main topic is about rebellion against authority. So even if the Muslim leader was a fasic, a wicked sinner, or perhaps maybe he was even a disbeliever in some cases. Some cases they weren't even Muslim. But they still ruled over a Muslim society. They were still the president or the whatever or the, 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 the uh, prime minister or the king or the whatever. They were part of a monarchy. Whatever system that they had in place, the society was still a Muslim society and the leader, whether they were Muslim or not, they could have been a wicked Muslim leader. They could have been uh, uh, someone who was not even a Muslim. The people rebelled and those societies still feel the effects and still have no stability. Nor did any party, except for those people of fitna, gain anything. Because people live in fear. And they don't have any kind of stability in their society. So this is the if sad. This is the wickedness that we're talking about that is a result of this. Look at Iraq. Iraq, we had a wicked fadger, Saddam Hussein, who was a disbeliever, as many of the ulama may take fear of him. But taking throwing this man out of power has opened up a, uh, and in the way it was which it was done has opened up uh, and, and been uh, something that uh, contributed to sectarian violence between the Shia and the Sunni populations there the Tekfiris are there the Tekfiris were there the jihadi Tekfiri groups were there Zarqawi and others and they just blow, blow up people in their shrines, blow up people in the soup, blow up people in the mosque. They don't care anywhere. The hospitals, it doesn't matter if it's the women's teacher's college. They blow them up. So the fitna was unleashed by rebelling, at least during this wicked shaitan, his leadership, there was a type of stability and perhaps some room for Ahl Sunnah to move and breathe. And likewise, we see what's the state in Yemen with the Hothiyin movement, the ex-president, 
the people who want to separate in the south, and then you have uh, Ahlul Sunnah caught up in the middle, trying not to involve themselves in warfare and the shedding of blood of Muslims. And again, it has no stability for the society. How do you educate your children when you're worried about a car bomb? How do you travel through the country if you're worried about hijackers of a group of this group or this group who will kill you because of your creed or just kill you for your money? No stability. So this is a greater harm than removing an evil leader. And that's the whole principle what this is based upon. Al-Maslaha wa Mafsada. The greater Maslaha is, in most cases, leaving a harmful ruler in place, even if he's a wicked sinner, than it is to remove him. And even if he's a disbeliever, if you do not have the ability and you have nothing better, and it's going to cause bloodshed, more bloodshed for the Muslims, and pain and suffering in the society in order to remove somebody like that. So it shows you the qawa'id of Ahl Sunnah, how strong they are. And how if we stick to that minhaj and that madhab that Imam Muqbil was talking about, which is in accordance to Kitab Allah wa Sunnah to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the understanding of the Salaf, we, we have success. Then we reached the port where the, where the, the Prophet, he mentioned the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu said, if someone comes to you and they command you uh, and, and they're comm they, they are ruling over all of you and it is one man, you know, it was one leader. And then someone comes and they want to divide the Muslims. They want to uh, split the Muslims. And divide your group, meaning the, the body of the Muslims, the main body, not a particular sect, a Hezb or anything like this. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, then fight this person or kill this person. because they, Why? Because they're a source of fitna. They want to divide. You already have a Muslim leader, even if he's a wicked leader. Then you have another guy who's rebelling and coming to divide the Muslims. This person should be fought. Why? Because they're causing bloodshed and harm to the Muslims uh, the Muslim society, their property, their families, their wealth, their honor. Everything is trampled upon and destroyed. And then he mentioned another, uh, the many uh, hadiths where a very famous hadith, the hadith of uh, Ubadat ibn Samit, radiyallahu ta'anu, where he said, Da'ana Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. دعانا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فبايعناه فقال فيما أخذ علينا إن بايعنا على سمع وطاعة في منشطنا ومكرهنا وعسرنا ويسرنا وأثرة علينا وألا ننازع الأمر أهلي إلا أن تروا كفر بواه عندكم من الله فيه برهان. In this hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, which is a very famous hadith, and this is a, a longer subject, and we're not going to make it long, but I'll, I'm going to end just to keep everything the the sitting brief as possible. This hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, the hadith of uh, Ubadat ibn Samit رضي الله تعالى عنه, where he said the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم called called us. And we gave him the bayah. We gave him the pledge, the oath of allegiance. And, he, and we gave him the bayah in those things which he had commanded us. And in order to, to hear and obey uh, the authority in that which is difficult for us and that which is easy and that which we like and that which we dislike. And that this is binding upon us and that we should not take the affairs from those charged in authority or those people who are ahlan for that. That you know, we should be respectful of the authority. And then the Prophet وسلم, he was asked about, uh, about this in this hadith, it's a longer hadith. And the Prophet وسلم, responded by saying, Illa and taro kufrin bawaha. Because they ask, should we rebel against this, if this guy, if it's a wicked leader in one of the narrations, should we rebel against him, Ya Rasulullah? Should we fight them? The Prophet ﷺ said, uh, said, no. 
unless you have open disbelief uh, that is made apparent and clear from a law that you have this proof, meaning that this is open, unquestionable disbelief. The ulama are in agreement. The ulama qadimin, the salaf, had an ijma on these things. Not that something where there's a difference, because when you make takfir or something and it's regarding an issue that the ulama differ over, then you cannot make that a binding hukum upon the people to follow. Meaning that some say yes, some say no, that this is an act or this person uh, is a disbeliever. Then you can't say, oh, if you don't make takfir and rebel against this person or whatever the situation is, you're no, you're no longer a believer. That is not the, the application of the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, where he said, men lam yukafir al-kafir fuhuwa kafir. This is the statement that the takfir is used, so I, I want to make a tenbi of this, that... Uh, many of the uh, takfiris and extremists, they make, they use, they try to misuse the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah where he said, the one who does not consider a disbeliever to be a disbeliever, then he is a disbeliever. And this is, of course, one of the nawaqid al-Islam that uh, Imam Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab mentioned in his treaties as well. But that's why it's important for us to understand the meanings, not just based on our desires or just taking the text and running with it, but you have to understand the details regarding that. What is? How does that go in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah and the understanding of the Salaf and the Ummah? How do they understand these principles? Because you can't just come up with a new principle and apply it to the religion. But these are principles that come back from Dalil. So how is that Dalil? How is that evidence understood? That's very imperative, my brothers and sisters in Islam, for us to understand. So, with that being said, that, that principle, that is for... The though those who are their their kufr is indisputable, meaning there's no difference with the ulama regarding it. That it is something ma'lum in the bi darura. There's something that's known by necessity in the religion, and likewise something. Uh, for example, when it comes to takfir, those people who Allah or Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam made takfir of. So, for example, the Jews and the Christians. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala has let us know that Jews and Christians are not Muslim. There's, they're not believers. They, they don't have a way to go to Jannah. The ones that are living uh, during the time and after the time of the Prophet wasallam, if they didn't die before him and, and believing on some type of Tawheed and monotheism, then they are not, uh, the, you know, from the, the deen of Ibrahim, wasallam, if they weren't upon that, a deen al qayyim a deen al hanifa then they are, they are not believers and they will not go to paradise. They will be in... The Jahannam Khalidina Fiha, Abada, that will be in the hellfire forever. So, with this, the person who denies this as a Muslim, either they are totally jahil, maybe a new Muslim, okay, this person is understandable, then this person you should teach them, you teach them, or something like this. But the Muslims all should know, and they can get this in, in Jews Amma, in the Surah Al Bayyina, in many surah, surah that let us know that. Those people from Ahl Kitab are not Muslim. They are not believers. They are disbelievers. They are kafir and they will go to hellfire unless they accept the beautiful religion of Islam. That's the way it is. So the one who negates that, they're negating what Allah says. This is the understanding of that principle. They're negating what is known by necessity and what it, they're negating the Quran. The Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can't negate the Quran. If you negate the Quran knowingly, then this is disbelief. Absolutely. But if you do something unknowingly because you're new to Islam and you don't have much knowledge or whatever, you know, people make mistakes, then this is something else. Perhaps the person has other bi jahil. Perhaps the person has other bi ta'wil. You know, or other uh, reasons that the ulama or ikra, you know, other reasons that the people are, uh, would be excused for. So these are just some of the principles. And the shahid here, Ahmadullah, is that Ahlul Sunnah does not believe in rebelling against Muslim authorities, nor are we people of rebellion, nor are we people of extremism and car bombs and blowing ourselves up and suicide missions as we see groups like IS or ISIS or ISIL and many others before them and after them, Hezbollah, you know, the Shia Rafida group and, and others who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
by innovating in his religion and claiming it's from his religion. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil.